Hello and welcome back to All Things Money. During this segment, we're going to continue our discussion of the family's net worth uh, and its effect this recession has had on the average family's net worth. If you missed uh, the first segment, head on over to our website, www.dlblaine.com. And during the first segment, we talked a little bit about the shrinking uh, applicants for law school, MBA school, those type of things, and changing nature of the job market, how we see an increase in science and math majors, and kind of tied that all into if you're looking for college for your kids and, and paying for it and borrowing money, make sure that you're staying up with what's going on in the job market because a lot of the, the jobs that were there in the, the 2000s or maybe when you went to college are not there, and you don't want to you know, pay $100,000 for uh, a humanities degree or something of that nature. And in this particular article that was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the, the law school, uh, the, the jobs for lawyers, um, for one reason or another, is actually declining. Anyway, so then now we're talking about how the fam average family's wealth in America has declined to the level of the early 90s. A lot of it lost in housing. On the positive side, we see that Families have been deleveraging, reducing credit card debt, reducing all types of debt. Um, one thing that has gone up ties into our first story is the share of families with education-related debt rose 19.2% uh, from 15.2% in 2007. So we see that um, education loans are making up a larger portion of the family's obligations than uh, to buy automobiles for the first time in history. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't want people, you know, financing fifty, sixty thousand um, dollar, you know, cars. But at the same time, you, you, all education debt is not the same. And just make sure that that you know what you're getting. Um, some other statistics from the Fed survey: families with income in the middle sixty percent of the population, and this is key, the middle sixty percent lost the larger share of wealth over the three-year period than the wealthiest or poorest families. And, and one of the basic reasons is because a lot of their wealth is disproportionately tied up in their homes. Now, I'm not saying you should go out and borrow 120% you know, of the value of your home or anything like that, but what I'm saying is for you to at least consider that paying off your home is not the only strategy. And if all your net worth is tied up in your home, that's a very bad idea. That a home is a place to live, it's not an investment. And if you're working your whole life you know, to pay off your home and you, you get it paid off and then you have no other sources of income or you have no other money, that's not necessarily a good thing. And there's nothing wrong with renting either. Anyway, we'll save some of that for, for another show, but suffice to say that Having all your net worth tied up in the housing is not a good idea. Uh, we see that the earnings of the median family in the body, bottom 20% of income actually increased from 2007 to 2010, part because of the expansion of government aid programs and, of course, wealthier families, which derive more income from investments, also were, because of the recovery of financial assets, were more cushioned than the middle um, 50%. Uh, the data does indicate, though, that the recession reduced the income inequality in the United States, um, at least, you know, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently, I don't know, but it did reduce the income inequality that fam the wealthiest families' income fell much more sharply than the median, uh, indicating that some of those at the very top slipped many rungs down the ladder. And that's also another point is that you see people at the top of the income uh, structure, a lot of times they move in and out of that uh, much more rapidly than people in the middle. You see that people uh, in the middle income, you know, kind of stay in there. Uh, sometimes they'll pop up to the wealthiest and drop back down. But anyway, that's some interesting reading from the, from the, New, York, um, the New York Times. All right, last week we started a little series. We were talking about how the economy works, trying to give a basic understanding to people of how the economy works and what causes recessions and depressions and, and you know different things like that. And so we started talking about 
how the economy is really the sum of all transactions of a buyer's giving either money uh, in the form of you know dollars or or credit, either a loan or credit card or something, to a seller for a good or service or financial asset. And that you have markets of similar items where these transactions takes place. And so the economy is an aggregate of all the markets out there. You know, the stock market, the you know, grocery market, the oil market, all these different markets make up the economy. And so the total dollars or credit spent and the total quantity sold is really all the knowledge that you need to know about the economy and that the price is equal to the total dollar spent divided by the total quantity. Now measuring those is very difficult, but the reality is the economy is very simple when you think about that. It's the total money or credit spent and the total quantity of goods and services uh, sold. Now, um, of course, spending comes from both cash as well as credit. Any part of uh, someone agreeing to pay money in the future is credit. And so the, the thing about credit is it can be created out of thin air is that if your neighbor wants to buy your lawnmower from you and say, yeah, that's fine, you can pay me in a year, you as an individual have just created credit. You're not a bank, you're not the Federal Reserve, you're not the government, but you have just created uh, credit. And so that person paid you with credit for that lawnmower. We're coming up on a second break. When we come back, we'll continue with this discussion on the economy in simplified terms.